Why did Nicholas Browning, fun-loving Boy Scout and bright student, wind up murdering his whole family? I'm Allie and this is Killer Bites, the show giving you bite-sized coverage of the hottest true crime cases. This case took place a while back, February 2008 to be precise. It ultimately begs the question, do you deserve leniency if you have a good reason for killing your whole family? Before you decide on an answer, here's the tea and trust it's piping hot. The case involved 15-year-old Nicholas Browning, born in 1990. He was the eldest son of John Browning, a business attorney, his mother, Tamara Browning, and his two younger brothers, Benjamin and Gregory Browning. Nick was described by his friends as very nice and a good student. Hard to believe a guy like that would commit a crime like this, right? Nick and his family and friends lived in the suburb of Cockeysville, Maryland, a calm and quiet area. The evening of February 2nd, 2008, Nick's parents and brother, Benjamin, dropped him off at his friend, 15-year-old Ryan Fingles' house, for a sleepover with their two other friends, 15-year-old Taylor Tewksbury and 15-year-old Alexander Smith. Tragically, that was the last time Nick's family was seen alive. The following morning, Nick, Ryan, Taylor, and Alexander went to Nick's house and discovered Nick's parents and younger brothers dead from gunshot wounds. Furthermore, a door had been left unlocked. The police were notified and took all four boys into custody for interrogations. Nick immediately claimed it was a burglary. Here's the background. The four boys are each placed in separate rooms. Heads up, the fellas have a tough time keeping their story straight in the beginning. Maybe it's the fear of going to prison forever? The interrogation started with Taylor, who seemed the most nervous due to his constant fidgeting. He also seemed the most likely to tell the truth. According to his account, him, Alex, and Nick spent the night at Ryan's house. After school, the day before the murder, Taylor, Alex, and Nick arrived at Ryan's house where they played video games and watched movies. Ryan's parents were at the home as well. The detective interrogating Taylor takes a break and speaks with Nick in another room. Nick's head was down and he seemed half asleep until the detective entered. Not a good look for a seemingly innocent kid whose family was just murdered. The detective presents himself as someone friendly to build rapport with Nick, which apparently is a useful tactic to lower the chances of a suspect lying. The detective reads Nick his Miranda rights and goes straight into the interrogation, effectively preventing Nick from getting defensive and asking for an attorney. Nick is actually very well composed and calm about it all, which is definitely the sort of behavior to give a side eye at. Based on Nick's account, he got home from school at 2.45 p.m. the day before and went to Ryan's house after. The detective then goes and gets Ryan's account. He says they all spent the whole evening at his house and at one point went for a walk around the neighborhood. Ryan further reveals that Nick's house is fairly close by, only a half mile away. He went on to mention that Nick went back home around 12.30 a.m. with plans to sneak and get his car so they could all go for a drive. Ryan explains that Nick told them when he got to his house, all the lights were on. Assuming his parents were awake, he hopped in his car and fell asleep. That's very hard to believe. Upon discovering that he'll no longer be able to sneak away with the car, why didn't he just go back to Ryan's house? Why get in the car at all? Furthermore, the time Ryan mentions is around the same time Nick's family is murdered. If Nick was there, wouldn't he have seen or heard this alleged burglary? And who would burglarize a house with the lights on? Ryan also reveals that Alex called Nick later to check on him, and that's when Nick said he'd fallen asleep and would head back to Ryan's house. After this, the detective goes back to Taylor to see if Ryan and Nick's versions of the events checked out. Taylor says he fell asleep and woke up around 12 a.m. He also says Nick was there during this time. However, he quickly changes his mind and says Nick was actually gone. At this point, Taylor is hesitant to reveal more information and continues to fidget. It seems like he's afraid of what'll happen if he rats on his friend. He should be more concerned about going to juvie for lying for Nick. The detective manages to get Taylor to relax and this causes Taylor to mention how Nick told him he was to grab his car but wound up not being able to. Taylor had gone to sleep after Nick left. When he woke up, Nick was back and said he'd fallen asleep in the car and walked back to Ryan's. This is consistent with Ryan's account of what Nick did. This doesn't mean Nick is out of the hot seat though. The detective gets back to Nick who says he went home around 1.30 a.m. to try and get his car. The keys, however, were inside the house and the lights were on. Nick said the lights being on put him off of taking the car as it would be going against his parents' wishes. So he went and sat in the car and waited for them to turn the lights off and fall asleep. I found this a little suspicious. If you couldn't get the keys to his car, presumably, how did he get in his car? Something definitely doesn't add up with this story. Nick wound up falling asleep and got woke woken up by a call from Alex around 5 a.m. asking for his whereabouts. After speaking briefly, Nick walked back to Alex's house. The detective goes back to Alex, who has an entirely different version of what happened. According to Alex, he and Nick slept in Ryan's living room and Nick never left the house. 
Interesting, right? The detective calls out Alex and says two of the other boys said Nick did in fact leave. He uses a scare tactic to get Alex to fess up. It works and Alex admits that Nick did leave Ryan's house to go and get his car around 12.45 a.m. Alex further revealed that he fell asleep around 1 a.m., woke up around 5 a.m. and called Nick, who said he intended to get the keys but fell asleep in the car for about three hours. The detective goes back to Ryan who also confirms that Nick was gone for about three hours. Now that the detective has gotten everyone's accounts for the night before, he asks asks everyone about the events leading up to the discovery of the crime scene the following morning. Taylor said the following morning after Nick returned to Ryan's house, they all had breakfast and got ready to leave. Alex's father, Mr. Pat, drove all the boys to Nick's house because they were going to spend the night there next. Taylor mentioned Nick had been worried because apparently Nick's mom was supposed to pick him up at 9 a.m. to clean the house, but she never came. He further mentioned Nick had been calling them since 11 a.m. and left messages, all of which went unanswered. Nick's account was similar to what Taylor said. He called his parents all morning after the murder and no one answered. Nick is good at playing up innocence. He presented a facade of caring about his family to try and convince detectives that he'd never harm them. No wonder the guy made it into AP classes. Ryan added a few more details that morning. He revealed that him, Taylor, Nick, and Alex went to the mall before Mr. Pat took them to Nick's house. He also maintains that Nick was worried about his parents because he hadn't heard from them. How could a boy so worried about his parents go to the mall instead of going home straight away? Something wasn't right. Nick added to his account of that morning. He mentions the mall trip and says when they all arrived at his house afterwards, they entered through the garage and walked through the door leading into the kitchen. Nick made sure to point out that the door was unlocked, which was unusual to him because it normally isn't. When the boys walked through the living room, Nick said the first thing he saw was his father, John, dead on the couch covered in blood. Nick and the other three boys went and talked to Mr. Pat before he drove away. Mr. Pat entered and called 911 as Nick went upstairs and found his mom and brothers dead as well. The crazy part, aside from the crime itself, is that as Nick recounted this, he showed absolutely no emotion. Granted, it could have been shock or he could have been the type of person to suppress everything and let it out later on, but there would be some sort of initial concern or confusion about such a horrific event, right? Nick was just way too relaxed for a guy whose immediate family had just been murdered so randomly. After this, the detective went and got Ryan's account of the crime scene. Ryan said that Nick's dad was on the couch, bloody and pale. They went and got Mr. Pat, who came in and moved the boys away from Nick's dad. Nick and Ryan went upstairs and found his mom dead in the master bedroom and his brothers dead in their room, all covered in blood. After this, Ryan took Nick outside. Next, the detective got Alex's account of the scene. Alex said he stayed by the stairs near the entrance of the home because he didn't want to see anything. Alex recounted Nick stating that he saw blood on his father right when Mr. Pat was about to pull off from dropping them off. Finally, the detective got Taylor's statement about the scene. Taylor said he saw Nick's dad dead on the couch and immediately ran outside to get Mr. Pat. He added that Mr. Smith came in yelling, asking John, Nick's father, if he was okay. Taylor then handed the home phone to Mr. Pat who called 911. Taylor further confirms that Nick went upstairs and found his mother and brothers dead. At one point, Taylor revealed that he and the other boys went outside and ran around the back of Nick's house to find any clues as to what happened. He said Nick opened the back door into the basement and saw his Xbox and Wii on the pool table. Think about that for a sec. What burglar breaks in, slaughters a family, but doesn't steal anything? Game consoles have a lot of value. Why leave them? The story got even more wild as interrogations continued and more information was brought to light. The detective visited Alex again for more details. Alex maintained that Nick never drove his car. However, what he said next put a big dent in Nick's story. Alex mentioned that while they were at the mall that morning, Nick told them he couldn't get the keys. Later, however, Nick pulled the keys out of his jacket pocket and said he didn't even know that they were in there. This was obviously obviously inconsistent to what Nick told the detective, which was that he never got the keys. Why would Nick leave out the part that he discovered them in his jacket pocket? Why lie? Nick was definitely hiding something. The detective switched tactics and asked the boys about Nick's home life. The information about Nick's private life that the boys gave added even more suspicion to Nick's involvement in the crime. Taylor revealed that Nick got in trouble a couple of times for drinking. After a few prompting questions from the detective, Taylor said that Nick never had a gun on him or talked about it and never mentioned being abused by his parents. Nick's own account about his personal life was that he was a good student, a good golf player, and that he got along well with his parents. After some prompting, Nick added that his dad didn't have any enemies and never mentioned any issues at work. At this point, Nick's story began to unravel and it became clearer and clearer that he was responsible for murdering his family. The detective spoke with Alex again and asked him if he knew anything else. Alex said no and the detective left. 10 minutes later, the detective returned and Alex said he remembered something. Conversation that followed was huge. Alex revealed that Nick called his brothers the night before and told them to keep the basement door unlocked so he could enter the house. Alex was definitely holding back information before, presumably to protect Nick. It's safe 
safe to guess that once the reality of the situation settled in, Alex got scared and decided to come clean. The detective moved back to Taylor to see if Alex's recollection was true. Get this, Taylor confirmed that Nick called his brothers but said he didn't know what was discussed. The detective asked if Nick told his brothers to leave the back door open and Taylor said yes. Taylor was very nervous and anxious by that point. He continued to fidget and stumble on his words a little. The detective went back to Nick after this. Nick's story gets even more flimsy. Nick recounted that after Mr. Pat came back, him and the boys went out back to the basement side door, which was unlocked. He added that the door is usually locked and that if he had to guess how anyone got in, it would be via the basement. The detective asked Nick when he last saw his parents. Nick replied that he last saw them when they dropped him off at Ryan's the night before. The detective then asked Nick if he spoke to his parents at all that night after being dropped off. Nick didn't give a straight answer and instead said that the plan was for them to come pick him up at 9 a.m. the following morning. Nick added that he never spoke to his brothers that night either and that he first tried contacting contacting his family around 10 a.m. the following morning. He received no responses. That was a lie, given that both Taylor and Alex said Nick called his brothers that night. Nick also maintained that he left Ryan's house at 1.30 a.m. to go and get his car and claimed that he didn't know how long it took him to get there since he got lost. At this point, it seems like Nick was deliberately giving the detective a time that is later than when the crime took place to mislead the cops. Nick must have known the police were getting more and more suspicious of him. Nick went on to explain that he arrived at Ryan's house around 3 a.m. and confirmed with the detective that his dad had two gun lockers. Nick listed the guns his father owned, adding that they've gone hunting before and he was familiar with how to use a gun. When the detective asks where the keys to the gun lockers are, Nick said he didn't know. The detective returned to Taylor for more information. Taylor revealed some concerning things about Nick and his father's relationship. Taylor noted that Nick told him his father called him a failure. In an apparent effort to make Nick look better, Taylor added that Nick did well in school and took AP classes. The detective went back to Alex, who said Nick never mentioned any family issues aside from saying his dad was hard on him. Alex maintained Nick was a nice guy and that Nick never talked about any guys and never saw Nick with any guns. At at this point, the detective stuck with the harsh dad narrative to get more information out of Nick. Nick revealed that he and his dad had issues, but his dad wasn't necessarily hard on him. He admitted to being caught drinking a couple of times. The detective alerted Nick that Ryan mentioned Nick called his brothers. Nick admitted to this, which is huge because he previously stated he never spoke to his brothers or any of his family in general the night before. Nick added that around 9 or 10 p.m. that night, he called his brother Greg and told him to leave the back door unlocked because he planned to go inside and grab the keys. This didn't align at all with Nick's feigned surprise at the back door being unlocked and exposes Nick's continual lying. When the interrogator asked Nick if he had any suspicions about who could have done this to his family, Nick mentioned a neighbor, Bobby, who was rumored to be a drug addict that had numerous run-ins with the cops. Nick was clearly trying to take the suspicion away from himself and move it to another party. If Nick really killed his family, why? The interrogator went back to Alex for more information about Nick's relationship with his family. Alex dropped some bombshells. He revealed that Nick said his little brothers were annoying, that his mother drank a lot, and that Nick called his father <laughs> Calling anyone, especially a parent <laughs> is a huge red flag. What did Nick's father do to make Nick compare him to one of the most evil men in history? After all of this, Alex, Ryan, and Taylor are allowed to leave. Nick was kept behind. The detective let Nick know his friends were gone and he seemed even more relaxed by that point, asking for food and something to drink. The detective brought him a burger, fries, and a soda. Nick comfortably sat and ate, completely unbothered and unfazed by how everything was going. After he finished his food, he even kicked off his shoes and put his feet up. Most people wouldn't have an appetite after their family was murdered, but hey, Gotta eat sometime, right? Nick didn't seem to care about their deaths at all. Over 25 minutes later, two other detectives, let's call them D2 and D3, came in and basically played the bad cops. They weren't nearly as nice and friendly as the first detective. D2 and D3 acted very accusatory towards Nick. D2 lied and told Nick that the other boys said Nick's father was unusually mean and livid towards Nick the night before the murder. This is a tactic meant to convince Nick that his friend turned on him, so he has to tell the truth. At this point, Nick had lost the calm, cool, and collected vibe he had before. His voice softened and he fidgeted more. Nick said when he got dropped off at Ryan's, his father checked and made sure Ryan's parents were really home. Nick insisted that his dad wasn't mean to him that evening. Nick added that his friends never actually saw his dad when he got dropped off, so they couldn't have seen his dad being mean. After that, D3 flat out told Nick he believes he was involved in the crime. Nick fell silent. D3 further implied that if Nick confessed, he might have a lesser punishment. On the other hand, if he continued to lie, the punishment would be more severe. D2 repeatedly told Nick that they needed to know why he did it and what happened. In efforts to guilt Nick and soften him up, D3 showed Nick a family photo. Nick wasn't moved in the slightest. D2 told Nick that no one broke into the house. Nick insisted he didn't kill his family, while D2 and D3 insisted he did. This was where Nick slowly started to break down. Both detectives used another tactic to get Nick to confess. They told 
told Nick that the police found the gun locker's keys in Nick's room under his mattress. D3 reminded Nick that he called Greg and told him to leave the back door open. Nick maintained his innocence, repeatedly saying he didn't kill his family. D3 said a 9mm was missing and both detectives continued to tell Nick he killed them. D3 switched gears and asked Nick why he called his dad Nick tried to make light of it, saying his dad was just strict and that it was a joke between them, adding that his mother even called him sometimes. I don't think you can normalize calling someone hit a little joke that came from a deeper place. Maybe hatred? Nick continued to insist that he didn't kill his parents and that he loved his family and that his parents gave him everything he wanted. Nick wasn't very convincing as he said it. D3 insisted that Nick was the killer and that the reason why he killed him was because of his father's strictness. Nick asked the detectives that if he killed his family, why would he put the keys under his mattress? If Nick cared so much about his family's death, he would be cooperating with police, not continually deflecting and asking the same question a thousand times. D2 responded to Nick saying Nick put those keys there because he didn't think the house would be searched. Both D2 and D3 also explained that they'd been working in their field for years and understood how different criminals worked, especially burglars. Both D2 and D3 made a note of saying that burglars never murdered their victims, only stole things. D2 then switched up and tried to lower Nick's defense by saying the murder was a mistake, basically normalizing the situation so Nick would be more inclined to confess. I gotta hand it to the feds. They sure know how to manipulate. D3 reminded Nick of how his parents were supposed to pick him up that morning to go and clean the house, yet he went to the mall with his friends. D2 added that Nick knew he didn't have to go home, assuming Nick killed his family. Nick responded saying he simply didn't want to go home and wanted to go to the mall instead to avoid cleaning the house. He added that he called and left messages so they wouldn't get mad at him. Nick's reason for calling his family changed. Before, he said he called them out of worry because nobody had come to pick him up. Now he said he called them so they wouldn't get mad at him for going to the mall. It seemed like Nick was panicking and could no longer keep his story straight. Nick insisted that his parents weren't that strict and didn't even ground him for the times he got caught drinking and repeatedly insisted he was innocent. Nick and the two detectives went back and forth about his innocence. D3 repeated the story that he believed Nick was trying to tell, which was that a burglar broke in, found the keys to the gun locker, opened the locker, took the 9mm and killed the whole family. D3 also asked Nick if he expected them to believe such a story. This next part? Nick started to tell on himself a little. A little more, I mean. Nick interrupted D2, saying he knew the burglar didn't find the keys and open the gun locker. Nick added that there were multiple sets of keys and that he didn't put them under his mattress. D2 insisted he did. Nick said the gun was already out and that he didn't need the gun locker keys, adding that it wouldn't make sense for him to grab the keys. If Nick didn't do it and wasn't there, how did he know the gun was already out? Further, why did he refer to himself as not needing the keys instead of saying the burglar didn't need the keys. After more back and forth, D2 and D3 left Nick alone in the room. 10 minutes later, they returned. D3 asked Nick about the keys in his jacket pocket. Nick admitted they were in his pocket and hadn't realized he had the keys until the morning. D3 pointed out Nick had lied once again and asked him why he killed his family. Nick insisted he didn't. Nick asked if he's going to jail over the gun locker keys and the two detectives didn't give him a straight answer. Nick and the detectives went back and forth some more before Nick asked how they were so sure he was the culprit, all the while continuing to insist he was innocent. D2 and D3 D3 told Nick the reason he was gone from Ryan's house so long was because he needed time to come up with a story to tell. D2 reminded Nick that he stated all the lights were on. Nick decided to change his story and said it was only his parents' bedroom lights. Like I said, Nick was starting to panic here and couldn't keep his story straight. The detective's tactics were starting to break him down. Nick told the two detectives that he didn't have to convince them of his innocence. D2 and D3 insisted that he did and told him he was being arrested for four counts of first degree murder. D3 handcuffed Nick to a pipe nearby, then both detectives left the room. This was another tactic meant to scare Nick into confessing soon. Nick was left alone for 40 minutes and wound up falling asleep in that time. Trying to keep up with all the lies he was telling must have been exhausting. Nick either didn't understand or simply didn't care about the severity of his situation. The original detective who was playing the friendly guy returned and uncuffed Nick. The detective confronted Nick about his lie, referencing the lights in the house. Nick laughed slightly about this and said he knew for sure that his parents' bedroom light was on. The detective reminded Nick that they needed a reason for why he did it. Nick's response to this this was very telling. Nick said that even with a reason, he would still go to jail. Clearly, Nick was more concerned about what would happen to him and wasn't at all concerned about having just lost his family. The detective repeated what D3 said before and implied that Nick's reasoning could be the difference between a light punishment and a more severe punishment. The detective also used phrases like cold-blooded killer and person who made a mistake, a tactic to get Nick to confess by identifying with the nicer sounding phrase. Additionally, the detective tried to play up the hurt child angle due to Nick's treatment by his father. 
father. Nick remained defensive and insisted that he was innocent. He added that the keys didn't mean anything. He assumed that the keys might be more important to the officers with all their experience, but they wouldn't mean much to a jury. The detective seized that moment to point out how Nick was already planning how to play the jury. Nick pivoted and asked how an explanation or reason would affect his jail time. Nick seemed to have realized that he wasn't getting out of this and was subtly trying to see what his options were regarding his sentencing. I don't think a truly innocent guy would be so concerned about himself and the time he's facing after what's occurred. Nick didn't believe that confessing and giving an explanation would lower the severity of his punishment. After some more back and forth, Nick continued to insist that a burglary caused his family's death. The detective took that moment to ask an important question. If a burglary took place, why would the burglar kill the family and not take anything? Nick's response was pretty poor. He said that maybe the burglar freaked out after the murder and left, adding that anyone could get freaked out after doing such a thing. He obviously knew from experience. If this whole interrogation was chess, this next part is where the detective could call check. The detective told Nick that the whole thing was staged to look like a burglary. Nick's entire demeanor changed and he got quiet again. After a few moments, Nick asked the detective how he knew it was staged and how he knew whether or not things were missing. The detective told Nick about his expertise in the field and they went back and forth some more and debated Nick's innocence. Nick mentioned the possibility of serving life in a mental institution as opposed to going to jail and actually brought it up a few times. The detective never gave a clear answer on whether or not it was a possibility for him. It seems like Nick was alluding to confessing if life in medical custody was on the table. Gotta find the silver lining, right? The detective eventually told Nick that they had enough evidence to convict him and that he needed a reason for the crime to see about a more lenient punishment. Nick argued that there wasn't a reason. The detective continued to tell Nick how serious his situation was, adding that he knew Nick was a good kid with a good reason for what he did. For some extra razzle dazzle, the detective assured Nick he only wanted to help, that he knew Nick didn't plan it and did everything because of how his dad treated him. Nick visibly started to break down and showed emotion. Going back to my chess reference, this was the checkmate. Nick admitted to the detective that he did kill his family and it was because of his father. Nick said his father physically abused him. The example Nick gave was when Nick's dad was taking him to a leadership camp that Nick's Boy Scouts group had put together. Nick said he had an attitude on the way to the camp and that his father got angry and hit him. Nick also cited mental abuse, saying his father sometimes called him a up. Nick said things started getting really intense that previous fall. Nick brought up how one time he had gotten caught taking out the car and his dad threatened to take it away. He further mentioned how his father got angry over a D he received, even though he made it up later and got a higher grade. Nick revealed that his father had hit him on more than one occasion and would even yell at him in front of his friends. Nick also mentioned that his father had been strict since he was in first grade and that it seemed like the older he got, the stricter his father became. He added that his father was angry with him at the night he got dropped off at Ryan's. Finally, Nick spoke about the murder. Nick said when he went back to his house, he saw his father sleeping on the couch and knew the gun was on the workbench. Nick grabbed the gun and sat for about half an hour, presumably thinking of his next move. He eventually went and stood over his father and aimed the gun at his head. He moved the gun back and forth, torn between what to do. Nick said he didn't know if he meant to pull the trigger, but he did. Nick said the gun made a loud ringing sound and he waited a few minutes to see if his mother and brothers would wake up and come rushing down. They never did. He went upstairs to his parents' bedroom and shot his sleeping mother in the head. Then he moved to his brother's room and shot them both in the head as well. They were also asleep. The detectives asked why he shot his brothers. Nick replied saying they wouldn't have been able to help him maintain the story he made up and it scared him. The detective also asked why he shot them all in the head. Nick replied saying he thought it would be a faster death. Wow. How considerate of him. The detective asked Nick where the gun was and Nick told him. Nick also agreed to go physically show the police where he stashed the gun. After that, the detective officially charged Nick with four counts of first degree murder. After trial started, Nick's other family members, including his grandfather, sent letters to the judge asking for leniency for Nick. Nick's grandfather backed up Nick's account of physical and mental abuse by his father. Nick took a plea deal in January of 2009 where he pled guilty to all four counts and was sentenced to four life terms in prison, two of which would be served consecutively. Four life terms is wild to process. Nick will be eligible for parole in 2031 after serving 23 years. Nick's story reminds me of a similar case regarding eight-year-old Maddie Clifton, who was murdered by 14-year-old Josh Phillips. Here's the brief background. On November 3rd, 1998, Maddie went missing in Jacksonville, Florida. Police were notified, conducted interviews with neighbors, and began searching. Hundreds of people volunteered and helped search for Maddie, but none of them found her. 14-year-old Josh Phillips' mother, Melissa Phillips, found her. Melissa went in Josh's room and thought his waterbed was leaking. 
seeing. When she went to check, she discovered Maddie's body hidden underneath. She immediately called the police. When Melissa found out Josh was at school, police arrested him there. Josh had no history of violence and no one could believe he was capable of something so terrible. Josh confessed to the police that he did in fact murder Maddie, but that it was an accident. Josh explained that he and Maddie had been playing and he had accidentally hit Maddie in the head with a baseball. Josh then carried Maddie into his house, into his room, and laid her on the floor, but she started crying and making noise. Josh said he grew afraid of how his father would react to come home and find Maddie in the house. From that growing fear and panic, Josh beat Maddie with a baseball bat and stabbed her to keep her from screaming and crying. Then he hit her under his bed. With this case, there were a few things I just didn't understand. If Josh knew his father hated other children being in the house, why did he carry her in rather than finding an adult nearby? Also, when Maddie began to make noise rather than trying to soothe and comfort her, why was his first idea to beat her to death to quiet her down? At 14 years old, I'd assume you'd have enough logic to understand that killing isn't the solution to quiet a child in pain and distress. Sources explained that Josh's father, Steve Phillips, was a drug addict and alcoholic didn't like having other children in the house, and had a tendency to be violent towards Josh and Melissa. This explained his fear of consequences, but didn't explain him beating a little girl to death. Ultimately, Josh, at 15, was charged with first-degree murder and was tried as an adult. On August 20th, 1999, Josh was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Josh is very similar to Nick in that they both had abusive fathers and committed murders from fear and panic. However, Josh at least showed some remorse and regret. Either way you look at it, the story is incredibly tragic, and a little girl's life was taken much too soon. Another case similar to Nick's took place in Elkmont, Alabama, where a 14-year-old boy confessed to shooting and killing his family, which included his father, stepmother, his younger sister, and two younger brothers. The boy, who was never identified, had called the police saying he heard gunshots while he was in the basement. When the police arrived, the boy said he ran out of the house as soon as he heard the gunshots. Upon deeper investigation, though, the boy's story didn't add up. Ultimately, the boy confessed to killing his family with a 9mm handgun. The boy helped investigators find the handgun, which he tossed after the murders. This this young boy, like Nick, killed his family and initially feigned innocence. I bet the detectives used similar tactics to what was used on Nick to get this boy to confess. Regardless, still a disturbing case. Consider another case like Nick's. In New Jersey, just before New Year's in 2017, 16-year-old Scott Kologi shot and killed four of his family members with a semi-automatic assault rifle. At a family party on New Year's Eve 2016, Scott killed his sister Brittany, mother Linda, father Stephen, and his grandfather's companion Mary Schultz. Scott's defense attorneys claimed he was mentally ill and his illness caused him to commit the murders. During testimony at the trial, it was revealed that Scott's mother Linda didn't want him telling his therapist how he thought about killing people because she was afraid that he would be hospitalized. It was also noted that Scott pulled the trigger 14 times, 12 of which hit the victims. Prosecutors stressed that Scott was well aware of what he was doing and wanted to kill them. They also mentioned that Scott planned these murders. Apparently, Scott researched if his weapon would be effective against police wearing bulletproof vests. He wore earplugs to muffle the sounds of the gunshots and lured Linda upstairs to shoot her. When Scott's father, Stephen, rushed in to see what happened, Scott shot and killed him too. After that, Scott went downstairs and murdered his sister, Brittany, and grandfather's companion, Mary. Scott's brother and grandfather were also home, but they were unharmed. Carol Kologi, Stephen's mother, asked the judge to send Scott somewhere he could get help for his mental illness. Ultimately, Scott was sentenced to 150 years in prison and must serve at least 85% of it, which is the equivalent of 127 and a half. In this case, it's a bit hard to determine if mental illness is truly the reason for Scott's actions. Granted, Scott allegedly told his mother previous times that he thought about killing people. There is no proof other than hearsay. The whole case is horrifying from beginning to end either way Way you slice it. Here's one more case that is really comparable to Nick's cases and other cases of teen serial killers. In Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2015, teen brothers Michael, 16, and Robert Bever, 18, killed their family, including the mother April, father Daniel, two younger brothers Daniel and Christopher, and five-year-old sister Victoria. Two other sisters survived, luckily. The mother, father, brothers, and sister all died of a combined more than 100 sharp force wounds, which were suspected to be from knives and a hatchet. April, the mother, tried to fight back and was stabbed almost 50 times. Authorities never revealed Michael and Robert's motives. However, neighbors said all of the kids were homeschooled and weren't allowed to socialize with the neighbors or play with kids outside of the family. After the attack, Robert told police that his parents abused them, citing instances where his father dragged him upstairs for leaving a light on and his mother slapped him so hard it left a mark. This led to Robert revealing how he planned the murder and hoped he'd get famous for killing them. This guy must have thought trying to make it as an actor or singer was for losers. Defense attorneys for Michael said he was led astray by his older brother, and Robert requested to take full responsibility for all of the murders. 
Ultimately, Robert was sentenced to life in prison without parole, while Michael was convicted for five counts of first-degree murder, plus 28 years for assault on their 13-year-old sister who survived the attack. For Michael, this adds up to 253 years, and by Oklahoma law, he's expected to serve at least 85% of them before he reaches parole eligibility. There certainly are a lot of commonalities between the teens who commit these mass murders of their families. The recurring theme in terms of motive is some sort of abuse and or mental illness. The usual arguments between opposing sides are either cold killer, scared and abused kid who made a mistake or mentally ill. Sometimes there's a blend of the last two. What do you think? Wild story about Nicholas Browning, right? Do you think Nick was justified in what he did? Did Nick deserve a lesser penalty since he was allegedly abused and scared? Was Nick really a good kid who made a mistake? Do you think his punishment fits his crime? Do you want us to go into more detail about the other cases mentioned in this episode? The Josh Phillips case, the Alabama case, the Scott Cologie case, or the Bever Brothers case? Please let us know any and all of your thoughts in the comments down below. I'm Allie and thanks Thanks for watching Killer Bites.